The things we can control and the things we cannot are thoughts, feelings, desires, and different aversions. In summary, we are responsible for everything connected to our actions. On the other hand, the body, money, power, and fame, everything that is not a natural part of what we do, is beyond our control. This is the first part of the famous manual of Greek philosophers, or Guide to Life. It is essential to understand that we cannot control everything in our lives if we want to live a happy and stress-free life. Our task is to focus on what we can control and not worry about what we cannot. The opinions and judgments of other people are among the worst things that can happen to someone. They will certainly have an effect on you, whether positive or negative. If you truly do not want to be affected, you need to understand that you cannot change other people's opinions or avoid a personal attack. By reading the Manual of Life, we learn what to do when someone hurts us. The point of this video is to extract eight teachings or principles from the famous Life Manual of Epicurus and show how they can help us achieve a mental state that allows us to significantly reduce or eliminate all suffering arising from others' judgments. This lesson will teach you why you shouldn't worry about what others think and how to reach a point where their opinions cannot hurt you. Consider subscribing if you are new here to not miss out on all the valuable content we are producing for you. Watch until the end to ensure you don't miss anything useful. It's time to begin. Insults or offenses. Epicurus says that we should always keep in mind that the person who attacks or insults someone is not the one being insulted, but rather believes that these actions are offensive. The next time someone upsets you, remember that it was their own opinion that caused the irritation. Try not to be influenced by appearances. Taking time to relax will make it simpler to maintain self-control. One way to stop caring about what others think is to realize that the insult or offense is not inherently bad. An insult makes us feel bad, but that negative feeling comes from how we handle the insult. If someone belittles or mistreats you, believe that the insult will only hurt you if you allow it to. If you react poorly, you will demonstrate how much negativity you can endure. When feeling insulted, it is a part of life. Consider whether you want to win or lose. Do you want to surrender to something you cannot control to prove that? Comparing stoicism with pleasures, they will always be there, so we should not fight against desire if we want to stop being affected by it. What sets us apart is how we deal with that desire, whether we give in or ignore it completely. If you can remain unfazed by the insult, the satisfaction you'll feel afterward will make you stronger and more capable of moving forward, even when things get tough. You probably remember a time when someone said something negative that ruined your day or week, no matter how hard you tried. Know that I understand how you feel because we've all been there at some point. If this sounds like you, I believe you should keep watching, as the next principles will be about self-control. Stay firm in your goals. In this principle, we need to know what to do if we don't want to be affected by what others think. If you truly want to grasp the philosophy, understand that people will mock you from the beginning. Be prepared to hear what people say, like, he suddenly became a philosopher, or where did this arrogant attitude come from? Make sure not to adopt that arrogant attitude and stick to things that are good for your well-being. Remember that if you stick to your beliefs, people who used to mock you will eventually admire you. But if you let others' opinions persuade you, you'll be ridiculed twice. People who wanted to learn to be philosophers don't need to become philosophers. Although the Greeks developed this idea that can be applied in all aspects of our lives, this principle is very important because many people ignore their true abilities just to please those who disagree with them. Epicurus says that if we let the fear of others' opinions change our purpose, we will not fail because we tried and failed, but because we yielded to others' opinions. We should not see this as a failure, but as a real problem. It's worth continuing when someone gives up just to avoid social problems or to prevent people from talking about them, even if people make jokes or question for a while. You will be living according to your nature if you move forward by making a choice in your life. Think about what is most important to you and why you are making the choices you are making. Don't stress if someone speaks ill of you, if someone hurts you or speaks ill of you, remember that they do it because they think they are right. However, don't assume that everyone will always follow the rules you've set. That's okay, but it may not be good for them. The important thing is that everyone has their own views and values, 
and we cannot change how others see us. Because of this, when they judge you based on a false or unfair appearance, they are harming themselves, as they miss the chance to get to know you better and understand you better. Be patient when others judge you in any situation, and remember that what others think of you shouldn't matter too much. It's important to know who you are and remain true to your values. Imagine you're a beginner artist and you've created a perfect painting in every aspect. You're satisfied with your work and post it on social media. However, some people criticize your art, pointing out issues with the colors and techniques you used. In this case, remember that these people are free to say what they want and may not like your style. You can't change how they feel about your work. Don't let negative opinions change you. Instead, be patient and keep telling yourself that your work still showcases your quality and personalization the way you intended. Don't let these opinions make you doubt yourself. The power of being mentally strong. Epicurus believed that in our fast-paced world, it's easy to let external events control how we feel. Often we sacrifice our inner peace for negative influences from the outside, such as a rude comment from a colleague or an unexpected problem. However, why do we let these external things enter our minds when we would never let a stranger into our physical home? The Stoic philosopher Epictetus says that we should respect our minds as much as we respect our bodies. We need to be more disciplined and have control over ourselves. You would never give the keys to your house to someone and you shouldn't allow insults or problems to disrupt your mood. How to fix this? Mental strength, self-doubt and rebellion must be built like a fortress. First, understand that an insult is only offensive when you interpret it that way. You, not the things people say or do, have the power to maintain your inner peace. Stop, take a deep breath and ask yourself, is it worth losing my peace of mind? The next time you feel anger or sadness, by using this easy but effective self-control technique, you'll often find it's not worth it. Not only will you avoid unnecessary mood swings, but your life will also be better for it, with a new sense of inner peace, a life free from external negativity, and a strong mind to handle life's challenges. Think about how liberating it would feel if you were in control of your emotions. Are you ready to strengthen your mind and bring back peace? Stay tuned as we delve into more details on how stoic principles can change your life. What will you do today to keep your mental home secure? Share your thoughts in the box below. Let's build a community based on what Stoicism says is right. Don't think about living in shame as if not being respected is something bad. Afterwards, other people can make us sad, but not everything works that way. The truth is, you are only someone in situations that you can control and that depend on your choices. These ideas are very important nowadays. Have you ever done something you didn't want just to get approval from others like on social media? Many people can become sick with social validation on these sites. We must ask ourselves if it's worth changing who we really are just to feel good. Should we depend on others for our mental health? It's easy to understand my answer. No. Think about it because at some point we have all been caught doing something that made us feel bad but had no intention of hurting anyone. What does it matter if they laugh at you or forget about you? Are you sure you're happy? It depends on how well known you are. You will never be happy if you live this way because you're not in control of your own happiness. Because of this, you will always be tense as you'll have to change who you are to maintain your reputation. One of the most important ideas in Stoicism is to care only about what you can control and not care about what you cannot. Don't forget that no one can hurt you unless you allow it. When someone hurts you or speaks ill of you, Remember that they are doing what they think is right. You're right that not everyone can act the way you see them, but it makes sense to them. When you go out and find that it's raining, you can do two things. You can let the bad weather make you angry or sad, or you can accept that you can't change it and choose not to let it affect your mood. The world around you doesn't change because of how you feel. Your response is the only thing you can change. You can live a happier and more peaceful life if you learn to be patient and accept that you can't control everything. If someone judges you because they don't understand something, that's their mistake. So be patient with people who speak ill of you and keep telling yourself that it's just the way they think. Use your best judgment to decide what to do. People shouldn't feel bad when they see us following our values, even if they don't understand what we're doing. 
This is part of expressing and embodying who we are, and it requires courage to stand up for our values and beliefs. If we do what we believe is right, why worry about others judging us? Wrong, it is crucial to have faith in yourself and your choices. Sometimes it's not possible to make everyone agree on something, and that's normal. This is also true when we're on social media sites, where our happiness often depends on how popular we are or how others perceive us. It's easy for social media to make us overly dependent on others' thoughts and opinions. We might act to please them instead of following our own path. In this scenario, imagine you are a scientist working on a very complicated project. Your approach might be a significant breakthrough and change the way we think about a major issue. There are scientists who will support and acknowledge your work when you share the results of your research with them. On the other hand, some people are ready to criticize and question how you do things. If that's the case, you should not change the way you conduct your research because others think differently. Instead, keep following the steps and advancing your work in the way you see fit. This way, you can maintain your freedom and creative thinking without worrying about what others think. However, this perspective can make us lose our independence and who we are. It's important to remember that our self-worth and our ability to make choices are more crucial than what other people think. Having faith in ourselves and our values will help us go further in life. By exercising self-control, it is possible to transform an insult into a non-offense. Epictetus said that we should treat our minds with the same care we give to our bodies. You wouldn't let a stranger enter your home every day if you knew it was a threat, right? However, when someone insults us, we allow them to enter our soul and stay there for days, as we later allow strangers into our hearts, something we would never do with our homes. Let's suppose you have a close friend whom you trust completely and to whom you confide all your secrets. One day you hear this friend speaking ill of you and disclosing a secret you shared with them in confidence. Initially, you may feel very hurt and angered, truly believing that your soul has been wounded and that you've lost all faith in people. In this situation, you may think that you allowed this friend to enter your soul and cause much harm. However, after reflecting, you realize that your friend may have been wrong about how they saw you, and their negative reaction should not control your soul. You don't want this event to have a lasting negative effect on your soul, so you choose to try to understand and forgive this friend. This not only helps you maintain your faith in friendship, but also prevents you from letting this event control your soul. It shows that you are disciplined and in control of your feelings, which helps you stay happy and makes your life easier. To reach a point where we can forget the bad feelings that come from an offense, we need to work on our discipline and self-control. Apply this in all aspects of your life, even with your family. When angry, you'll feel better about yourself and avoid a lot of unnecessary pain if you can control that emotion. Your life will change significantly because of this. With this eighth rule, no one can hurt you. With this eighth principle, we can figure out why someone is insulting others. Additionally, it shows that we cannot expect everyone to follow our worldview or what we believe is right. This way of thinking can be very detrimental. We should consider if it's possible to believe that everyone sees things the same way we do. This way of thinking is too simplistic and something to ponder. If someone insults you and thinks they really understand you, you are aware of your identity. You already know what you think, why you do what you do and how you act. You are the only person who truly knows the truth about yourself. So if a stranger insults you in some way, you should ask yourself, did I do something wrong? If you answered no, ask yourself, can I understand why the person said that? It's clear that you cannot. Suppose you're having a heated conversation with your friends about a delicate topic when suddenly someone starts harshly criticizing your viewpoint, pointing out flaws and disagreeing with you. Based on Stoic philosophy, here's how to deal with it. First, reconsider your opinion and see if it is backed by solid evidence and reasoning. If you are confident that your opinion is valid and logical, defend it with confidence. Second, don't get angry or upset. Keep calm when someone criticizes you. Think about how Stoic philosophy encourages people to be strong and calm. Third, see things from the other person's point of view. Try to understand the perspective of others. They may have their own reasons for what they think, and they won't always agree with you. Respect other people's viewpoints and avoid pointless arguments. 
Fourth, know yourself. Don't forget that only you truly know why you believe what you believe. You have given it careful consideration and have your own reasons. You don't need to be afraid or lose confidence when someone criticizes you. Fifth, keep learning and improving. Instead of getting angry, turn this situation into a chance to learn and grow. By seeing things from other people's perspectives, you may change your own opinions in the future. Stoic philosophy teaches how to handle criticism calmly and determinedly, helping you stay calm and focused on personal growth. So if you did the right thing and still don't understand why the insult was said, you should be happy because you are the only person who truly knows yourself. That's what Epictetus said. You shouldn't feel bad about people who insult you. That's what they think of you. In conclusion, I would like to conclude with this lesson from Epictetus. Do you think you can spend enough time to be worthy of the greatest progress and follow the rules of theory? The philosophical ideas you should know have been presented to you. Are you waiting for a different teacher to improve? Being careless, lazy and procrastinating until later will not help anymore. Now that you are an adult, life will continue passing by while you are blind until the day you die. Now let's move on to the second part. Thank you for being with us so far. Don't forget to check your subscription to the channel and give that thumbs up to support us even more. It is very important that you continue watching until the end because the best part is yet to come. We continue. The great Stoic philosopher Epictetus once stated that we should associate with those who uplift us, individuals whose presence highlights our best qualities. You've probably heard the expression that you are the average of the five people you spend the most time with. Today, we will explore this idea from a Stoic perspective. We will discuss the ten types of people who can hinder your progress in Stoic philosophy and why it is crucial to reconsider your friendships with them. Here are ten types of people you need to avoid. The first one is the complainer. We all have that friend, family member or co-worker who seems to find fault in everything. Whether it's the weather, work or even the food at a popular restaurant, they never miss an opportunity to express their dissatisfaction. You might wonder why should I care? I can just ignore them. Well, that is easier said than done. Consistent exposure to such negativity has a draining effect on your mental well-being. It's like a leaking faucet, slowly depleting your reservoir of emotional energy. Stoicism teaches us to focus on actionable solutions rather than dwelling on problems. Imagine collaborating on a project with someone who complains incessantly. Every meeting turns into an exhaustive session of grievances with no constructive dialogue. The team's morale declines and you veer away from finding actionable solutions. You will likely feel increasingly disenchanted with the project and possibly with life in general. From a Stoic philosophy perspective, you can apply some principles to deal with this situation. First, focus on what you can control. You cannot control the complainer's thoughts or actions, but you can control your own reactions and thoughts. Concentrate on improving your own performance rather than letting the situation deteriorate because of the complainer. Challenge negative thoughts. Their negative thoughts may not reflect reality or be significant, Challenge these thoughts and try to see the positive aspects of the project. Finally, create a positive environment. By incorporating stoic thinking and a positive attitude, you can influence the work group and help create a more encouraging work environment. Remember that stoic philosophy is not about changing others, but managing and reacting to the situations around you. It helps maintain a positive attitude and focus on solutions rather than getting caught up in someone else's negativity. How does Stoicism help us deal with a complainer? There are several strategies you can employ. First, limit your exposure to that person whenever you can. If that's not possible, perhaps because they are a family member or colleague, your second option is to distance yourself mentally during their complaints. Consider these complaints as a passing storm, loud and disruptive, but essentially temporary and powerless against the unshakable mountain that is your inner tranquility. Your third option is to steer the conversation towards solutions or change the subject to something more constructive. To quote Marcus Aurelius, you have power over your mind, not external events. Realize this and you will find strength. This timeless stoic wisdom encourages us to diligently protect our mental peace, ensuring that the negativity of chronic complainers does not steer us away from our inner path of resilience and virtue. The second type of person is the drama magnet. 
Imagine you are sailing through life as if it were a ship crossing calm waters, but suddenly you encounter the whirlpool known as the drama magnet. This person seems to have an endless series of crises, conflicts or controversies, and like a whirlpool, has an uncanny ability to suck you into their vortex of chaos. You might initially be drawn to the energy of the drama magnet, confusing it with passion or excitement. However, you will soon realize that being in their sphere is like navigating a ship through a storm, exhausting and dangerous. What makes dealing with obstructive people's drama challenging is that their urgent situations often make you feel as if they are your own. Their chaos can spread, and you may find yourself involved in conflicts in which you initially had no part. Consider a specific example. A friend who frequently gets involved in conflicts with others in your social circle. Imagine you have a friend named Sarah in your group. Recently, Sarah engaged in a heated debate about some issue in the group. The discussion escalated into a serious conflict between Sarah and several others in the group. Sarah seemed very angry and dissatisfied with others for not agreeing with her. She often criticizes and complains about other group members, showing a lot of frustration with the situation. At this point, you've started feeling pressure and tension for continuing to be part of this group. Sarah often brings these conflict situations into conversations and the main topics of group meetings, and there's no sign that she's going to stop. You tried talking to Sarah, attempting to resolve conflicts and offering advice, but it didn't help resolve the situation, and you failed to change Sarah's perspective or ease the tension. To apply stoic principles and avoid being dragged by Sarah's negative emotions, you can employ a technique called reflective listening. Instead of trying to persuade or engage in the conflict, you can reflect back what she says in a non-judgmental way. For example, when Sarah complains about others not agreeing with her, you can say, so you feel frustrated with their disagreement, right? This way, you don't participate in the argument and don't escalate the tension, but you still let Sarah know that you're listening and are empathetic towards her emotions. However, if Sarah continues to maintain the conflict situation and you feel that participating in this group is no longer aligned with your state of mind and goals, you can also apply the last strategy mentioned in the text, which is becoming selectively unavailable. This may involve temporarily stepping away from the group or seeking activities and relationships that are more in line with your mental state. Stoicism reminds us to value our time highly and sometimes that means being unavailable for other people's crises, especially if they are recurrent and unresolved. Turn off the phone during certain hours, create focus periods where you exclusively concentrate on your work or personal development, and make it clear that during those moments, you should not be disturbed. Paraphrasing Seneca, true happiness is to enjoy the present without anxious dependence on the future. This can be especially helpful when dealing with drama magnets, Instead of anxiously wondering what the next crisis will be, focus on the present moment, where you have control. Enjoy life, and don't let it be disturbed by someone else's drama. Make sure to steer your ship calmly, avoiding whirlpools that threaten your journey towards personal growth and tranquility. The third type of person to avoid is the unfavorable person. Imagine yourself as an artist painting a canvas, each brushstroke adding color, depth and life to your vision, and then enters the pessimist. They step into your studio, take a look at your work, and immediately start criticizing. Are you sure about this color? This doesn't look realistic. You know most artists never make it. Their words, like strokes of gray paint, begin to fade your vibrant canvas. This is not your standard constructive criticism. It's a persistent aura of doubt and negativity. For instance, imagine you are excited about pursuing a new career path. You've done your research, talked to experts, and even taken some introductory courses. When you share your excitement with others, they quickly list all the reasons why this may not work out. The market is too competitive. Do you have the necessary skills? And what if you fail? Soon their doubts begin to sound like yours, and your once confident vision starts to waver. But don't let their negative words defeat you or erode your confidence. Instead of embracing doubt and agreeing with them, Adopt a different approach. Ask yourself questions like, why is the market so competitive? Can I improve my skills to face this challenge? If I encounter difficulties, can I learn from my mistakes and failures to become stronger? This way, you can redirect their concerns towards seeking solutions and consider ways to overcome challenges 
rather than just focusing on the negative aspects. The key is to maintain belief in your own abilities and not let others' doubts diminish your determination to achieve your goals. How to deal with a pessimist, especially when it might be someone close to you? An unconventional but effective method is to seek advice from them rather than just sharing your plans or aspirations. When people are placed in an advisory role, they are less likely to attack your ideas directly and may offer more constructive feedback. Another method involves flipping the situation through a technique called positive confrontation. Instead of absorbing their negativity, challenge them to think of solutions. If they say you'll never be able to change careers at this stage, counter-argue with an interesting perspective. How do you think someone could successfully make a career change? This not only deflects negativity, but also encourages a more constructive conversation. Remember the words of the Stoic philosopher Epictetus, we have two ears and one mouth, so that we can listen twice as much as we speak. Listening doesn't mean absorbing everyone's negativity. It means discerning valuable input from mere noise. When pessimists start to blur your canvas with their shadows of doubt, take a step back. The fourth type of person to avoid is the toxic optimist. You know that person, the one who exudes constant joy, rainbows and endless emojis. They are the ones who tell you to just be happy when you're going through a tough time, dismissing your feelings and experiences with a superficial wave of bright optimism. Imagine your life as a garden. There are flowers, but there are also weeds and pests. A toxic optimist insists on ignoring anything but a rose in full bloom. If you have aphids on your leaves, they would say, focus on the flowers. While this may sound inspiring, this approach can make you feel invalidated and disconnected from reality. Let's imagine you're going through a difficult breakup. You're feeling sad, confused, and seeking emotional balance. A breakup can be one of the most challenging experiences someone can go through in life. You may feel pain, heartache, and even lost after the breakup. In these moments, advice from a toxic optimist can be extremely frustrating and unreasonable. In the vast sea, there are plenty of fish. Just smile and be happy. This statement may have broader context and be true in a larger sense, but it fails to acknowledge the pain and difficulties you are currently facing. A breakup can make you feel like you've lost a part of yourself, and simply smiling and living happily isn't always helpful advice. This kind of excessive positivity neglects the complexity of human emotions and the realities of life. Life is not always filled with happiness, and sometimes we need to confront negative emotions like sadness, grief, and disappointment. These are natural and inevitable aspects of life, and self-condemnation for feeling these emotions only amplifies the pain. Instead of suppressing all negative emotions and focusing only on the positive, we can learn to face them, accept them, and consider how they can help us grow and learn. The key is to maintain a balance between the positive and negative, experiencing life in a more realistic and balanced way. How to cultivate your garden without letting the toxic optimist trample it with their indiscriminate reign of good vibes only. One strategy is to engage them in a discussion that embraces both light and shadow. If they say to look on the bright side, at least you have your health, you can respond with, yes, I'm grateful for my health, but it's also okay for me to feel sad about this specific issue. Both can coexist. You can also employ what psychologists call emotional granularity, the ability to feel and differentiate between a wide range of emotions, both positive and negative. When the toxic optimist pushes you to just be happy, take a moment to acknowledge and label your nuanced feelings. Saying, I'm feeling a bit melancholic today because of some reason and that's okay, can be a liberating statement. In reference to Stoic thinking, Seneca once said, true happiness is to enjoy the present without anxious dependence upon the future. Notice the balance, understanding duties which are not always pleasant and enjoying the present. The Stoic approach is not to focus solely on the positive or negative, but to embrace the complexity of life with equanimity. So the next time the toxic optimist throws their confetti into your carefully cultivated garden, take a step back. Remember that a garden needs both sunshine and rain to flourish and embrace the full spectrum of your emotional experience. Continue nurturing your garden with the richness and complexity it deserves. The fifth type of person to avoid is the victim, Imagine life as a chess game, 
where each player has the same set of pieces and the same common goal, checkmating the opponent's king. Strategically, you make your moves, make sacrifices, and sometimes take risks. However, the victim blames the chessboard, the pieces, or even the opponent for every bad move they make. In their view, they are constantly in checkmate, not by their own choice, but due to an external force working against them. Their story is an endless tale of suffering, with themselves in the role of the helpless protagonist. This analogy helps us better understand how each of us faces challenges and makes decisions in this game. We all start with the same set of pieces and a shared goal. We need to think strategically and carefully plan our moves just as we move the pieces on the board. Sometimes we need to make sacrifices and take calculated risks to achieve our objectives. However, what sets successful individuals apart from victims is how they respond to failures and difficulties. The victim constantly seeks to attribute blame to external factors, such as the chessboard, the pieces, or even the opponent, whenever they face challenges or failures. Instead of taking responsibility for their actions or decisions, they believe that an external force is always working against them, and consequently, they perceive themselves constantly in checkmate. The victim's life often becomes an endless narrative of suffering, with themselves in the role of a powerless main character. They fail to recognize that they have choices and the power to control their own destiny. In contrast, those who succeed understand that life may present challenges and uncontrollable factors, but how they respond and decide their next moves in the game of life determines their destiny. The key is to recognize that in life, we all face difficulties and failures, and there are external factors that can affect us. However, the difference lies in how we deal with and learn from these situations. We may not always control everything, but how we react and decide the next move in the game of life determines our destiny. While it's crucial to acknowledge that some people face genuine hardships and systemic issues, the victim we are discussing uses their situation as a permanent excuse, refusing to take any responsibility for their actions or lack thereof. You may find yourself entangled in their narrative, perhaps as the supporting character who constantly needs to rescue them. Suppose you've spent countless hours listening to a friend blame all their failed relationships entirely on their ex-partners. This not only consumes your time, but can subtly encourage you to adopt a similar victim mentality in your own life. So, what's your move when dealing with a victim, especially when they might be someone close to you? An unconventional yet effective method is to ask them open-ended questions that encourage them to reflect on their situation. Instead of offering solutions or becoming the perpetual problem solver for their issues, try questions like, what do you think you could do differently in this situation? Or, how do you see yourself taking control of this part of your life? Another approach is to show empathy and kindness, but not try to rescue them from situations they need to navigate on their own. Offer a listening ear, but avoid becoming the perpetual problem solver for their issues. Remember the words of the Stoic philosopher Epicurus, the greatest revenge is to be unlike the one who performed the injustice. If you find yourself being drawn into the victim's narrative, resist the temptation to become one yourself. Take control of your own chessboard, make your moves, and remember that in the chess game of life, being perpetually in checkmate is often a choice, not a destiny. Keep advancing your pieces, make strategic sacrifices when necessary, and play not for revenge or pity, but for growth and wisdom. The sixth type of person is the time vampire. Imagine your daily routine as a carefully crafted symphony. Each instrument represents a task or commitment, and when played together, they create a harmonious balance. Then enters the time vampire, screaming out of tune, drowning out the melody, and disrupting the flow of your life's composition. Time vampires are individuals who constantly demand your time and attention, often without providing much value in return. It could be a friend who habitually calls you for long, vague conversations, leaving you exhausted and behind schedule, or a colleague who consistently interrupts your work with trivial matters, causing you to miss deadlines. Time vampires not only consume your time, but also disrupt your focus, productivity and peace of mind. To deal with time vampires, it's crucial to establish clear boundaries, communicate your availability and limits firmly but politely, and inform them about when you're available for calls or meetings, and when you need focused, uninterrupted work time. Encourage them to respect your schedule, just as you respect theirs. 
Another strategy is to redirect their demands to more productive or efficient communication methods. For example, if a friend tends to engage in lengthy and meandering phone conversations, suggest switching to shorter text messages or emails for quick updates or questions. This way, you can regain control over your time and avoid being sucked into unproductive, lengthy conversations. Expanding on the specific example of dealing with a friend who makes lengthy and indefinite phone calls, we can better understand how to apply a strategy to manage time and maintain effectiveness in our daily lives. By suggesting a shift to more concise communication methods, like text messages or emails, you not only save time, but also create a more convenient communication environment for both parties. Changing how you communicate can bring several benefits. Firstly, it allows you more control over your time as it enables interactions on your own convenient schedule without being limited by long and indefinite phone calls that you may not want or be able to answer immediately. Instead, you can read and respond to text messages or emails when you're ready. Secondly, using text messages or emails as a communication method can result in more powerful and efficient exchanges. You can organize your thoughts into concise and direct messages, helping the recipient understand and respond promptly. This optimizes the exchange of information and reduces time wasted on lengthy and vague conversations. Thirdly, adopting this form of communication can create a more conducive environment for discussing and resolving specific issues. You can focus on essential issues and requests, and the recipient can provide accurate responses without the need for prolonged discussions. This helps maximize the time for both parties and ensures tasks are carried out more efficiently. By implementing this strategy, you can assert control over your time and maintain effectiveness in your daily life. By diplomatically proposing an improvement in communication, you're creating a positive and convenient environment for both you and your contacts. In Stoic philosophy, there's a focus on understanding what is under your control and what is not. Time vampires often try to take control of your schedule and attention, but you can assert your control by setting boundaries and managing your time intentionally. Remember the words of the Stoic philosopher Seneca, it's not that we have a short time, but that we waste much of it. Associating with people who uplift you and are aligned with Stoic principles is crucial for your progress in Stoic philosophy and personal growth. The seventh type of person to avoid is the manipulator. Imagine your life as a movie script where you are the protagonist with a vision of how your story should unfold. The manipulator is like a shadowy producer who subtly rewrites your script without you realizing it until your story veers off course. Manipulators are skilled in emotional and psychological maneuvers, using compliments, guilt traps, or deceit to guide you in a direction that benefits them. For example, a friend may consistently make you pay for dinner, presenting it as a favor to a needy friend. Over time, you may realize that your generosity has been exploited. Dealing with a manipulator can be tricky, one method to neutralize their tactics is called fugging, which involves agreeing with any truth in their statements, but refusing to be moved by emotional coercion. If they say you are successful and should pay for dinner, you can respond by agreeing with the success, but suggesting splitting the bill as usual. Another approach is to set clear boundaries and enforce them. If the manipulator wants you to lend money or take on tasks you're not comfortable with, learn to say no assertively maintaining a calm tone and clear words. You can say you cannot lend money, but are available to offer emotional support. Draw inspiration from Stoic thinking. Epictetus warned us, we cannot choose our external circumstances, but we can always choose how we respond to them. The manipulator thrives on your predictable reactions, manipulating your kindness, guilt, or desire for approval. By choosing to respond differently, you are reclaiming control of your script. So. If you find a manipulator in your life, remember that you are the one holding the pen. Your story is yours to write, and while the cast may include a variety of characters, the journey of the protagonist, your journey, should always be guided by your values and decisions. Claim your script, and don't allow anyone to manipulate the narrative of your life. The eighth type of person to avoid is someone who indulges in excess. Moderation is one of the principles of Stoic philosophy, and for many, accumulation does not solve their problems, it only changes them, as Seneca stated.
People who like to eat and consume excessively are always in search of pleasure, often to their detriment, whether in material goods, food, or any other indulgence. Their lack of self-control can create an unstable whirlwind. Consider the example of Jack, someone who likes to indulge in excess. He frequently indulges in extravagant shopping, regularly attends luxurious parties, and often dines at sophisticated restaurants. Jack constantly seeks pleasure and happiness through accumulating many things, often material possessions or extravagant experiences. This leads to a lack of self-control in managing his finances, time and energy. Stoic philosophy emphasizes balance, moderation, and a focus on spiritual values rather than material ones. They believe that true satisfaction comes from understanding our limitations and living a life based on ethics and self-control. In Jack's case, he can learn to focus on spiritual joys and control his greed and excessive consumption, helping him achieve true balance and happiness. The ninth person to avoid is the gossip. In today's modern world, with the ease and speed of communication, gossip has become prevalent. These people spread stories with little regard for truth or the negative impact they may have. Associating with them is akin to sowing seeds of distrust and misunderstanding in your life. As Marcus Aurelius said, waste no more time arguing about what a good man should be, be one. Being stoic means seeking virtue and truth. Engaging in gossip takes you away from that path. It's not only important to avoid getting involved in gossip, but also to avoid those who don't respect these values. In summary, be cautious of those who share unverified information and stories, and don't trust those who don't uphold morality and truth. Imagine working in a competitive and sensitive workplace environment. You've completed a challenging and significant project and are proud of the results. However, after a short while, you hear from a colleague that there are negative rumors about you and your work circulating in the company. In this case, the role of the gossip monger is played by your colleague who created a tense atmosphere and promoted misunderstandings about you and your work, spreading inaccurate and disrespectful information. By engaging in this negative gossip, the gossip monger has harmed not only your morale at work, but also the workplace environment as a whole. In such a situation, you can apply stoic philosophy by maintaining your integrity and not allowing gossip to stain your character or morals. Instead, continue to work with virtue and produce high quality work so that your truth and values shine more than the uncertain rumors. The last person to be avoided is the Lord of Pessimism. Some may argue that a cloudy sky has its own beauty, but pessimists only see the promise of rain. Their minds are like dark rooms without windows for light to enter, focusing exclusively on the negative aspects and being blind to the opportunities that challenges often bring. Marcus Aurelius reminds us, reject your sense of injury and the injury itself disappears. This is a testimony to the power of perspective. Optimism, or at least a balanced mindset, is considered important in Stoic philosophy. In Stoicism, it's not the external events, but how we evaluate them that causes disturbance. Stay away from those who constantly wear the mantle of negativity. Throughout the journey called life, our social relationships shape our path. Who wants someone to dampen spirits in peak moments or induce a negative mood during challenges? Now, a quick test for you. Among these characters, have you recently encountered someone or does someone in your life frequently deal with them? Leave a comment below. I'm genuinely curious. By recognizing and avoiding these 10 types of individuals, you can protect your peace of mind, focus on what truly matters, and navigate your stoic journey with resilience and virtue.